And good afternoon, uh, uh, dear colleagues. Welcome to the very special webinar today, organized by two European reference networks. There are ERCNET, so the Kidney Network, and the Rare Eye Disease uh, Network, ERNI. So the topic of the webinar today will be the disease which covers different organs, which is a bartle beetle syndrome. And um, I will moderate this modern uh, webinar for you today. My name is Elena Levchenko. I'm a pediatric nephrologist from um, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. So we have two very distinguished speakers uh, who are real specialists in bartle beetle syndrome. Uh, the first speaker is um, Dr. Jens Koenig, who is a pediatric nephrologist at the Children's University Hospital in Münster, Germany. Uh, right from the beginning of his nephrological career, he developed a special interest in hereditary cystic kidney diseases, in uh, more specifically nephronophthysis and nephronophthysis-related ciliopathies. So in 2010, he set up a national clinical registry for nephronophthysis and related disorders, which later developed into a huge international neocyst database. Uh, since 2016, Jens is a coordinator of the Big Neocyst Consortium, which is a multidisciplinary research network dedicated to improve clinical and molecular understanding of renal ciliopathies. And one of these is uh, the bartle beetle syndrome. So um, I think we have an, really an expert, and um, the second speaker, Elaine Dolphus, I'll introduce later on. So Jens, I think the floor is yours, and uh, we are very much eager to hear your talk. For the audience, just to remind you, you can write your questions during the presentations, but we will do all questions and discussion after the two talks, so please. Please go Thank on, you. Yes. Thank you very much, Elena, for this very kind introduction. Yeah, it's our great pleasure today to give you a brief overview on a quite complex and, and challenging clinical entity, um, the Bartle beetle syndrome, as you mentioned. Um, as you mentioned as well, I'm a pediatric nephrologist in Münster, Germany, and I have the privilege to start with a general overview and the renal aspects of Bartle beetle syndrome, followed by Professor Elaine Dolfus, who will provide you then with uh, a detailed insights into the ophthalmologic topics and new Bartle beetle related developments. I would actually like to start with a case from our day clinic to illustrate the challenges that are related to uh, already the setting of the correct diagnosis. This is the story of Ali, um, who was born after 36 weeks of gestation with a birth weight of 2.2 kilograms. And in the uh, 26 week of gestation, Oligoid Ramnios was diagnosed together with enlarged polycystic kidneys. And owing to this picture, the presence originally decided for palliative postnatal care with no measures of intensive life support. However, Ali decided differently and he was breathing properly with no need for ventilation at all and thus referral to a center offer, offering maximum care, including neonatal dialysis was organized. Yet after a few hours, not only the lung, but also the kidney situation improved spontaneously with uh, the development of sufficient urine production. First kidney ultrasound was indeed suggestive for autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, showing bilaterally enlarged hypoechogenic kidneys, blurred medullocortical differentiation and multiple cystic lesions in the cortex and in the medulla. However, there was no arterial hypertension and over time um, also the ultrasound picture, a picture got less and less ARPKD-like. And finally, there was this tiny little hint that made us doubt the diagnosis and go for early genetic testing, an additional toe on his right foot. And indeed, what we found was a homozygous pathogenic variant in the BBS12 gene. This is Ali today at an age of two and a half years, presenting chronic kidney disease, polydipsia of more than one and a half liters a day, progressive retinopathy, early onset obesity, muscular hypertonia and delayed motoric and speech development on one hand, but um, lots of fun and energy actually on the other hand. But 
let's address body beetle syndrome in, in a more structured way. As all of you will know, body beetle is a very um, rare inherited disorder following an autosomal recessive trait. It's a multivisceral disease, as Eleanor mentioned, with potential affections of different organs and systems. Prevalence varies between uh, 1 in 120,000 and 160,000 in North America and in Europe, while in some other regions of the world, body beetle syndrome is observed a lot more frequently. The diagnosis of BBS is based on clinical criteria originally published by Phil Beals in 1999. And six primary features have been defined consisting of progressive retinopathy, obesity, postaxial hexadactyly, kidney anomalies, learning disabilities, and hypergonadism or genitourinary abnormalities. To set the diagnosis, the presence of at least four primary features or three primary features and two secondary features is required. Those primary features can be found in varying frequency. While almost all patients develop some, uh, develop some kind of retinopathy, only about half of the patients display kidney involvement. And about three quarters of affected patients display polyductyly and develop obesity and cognitive impairment. Polyductyly is indeed one of the earliest signs suggested for BBS, particularly when it is present in association with hyperacogenic kidneys or genitourinary abnormalities. In some cases, polyductyly can um, even be detected prenatally already as um, presented here in this picture. Polyductyly may either affect all four limbs or only one single hand or foot. And furthermore, other skeletal anom anomalies like brachydactyly or syndactyly can be found um, as well as shown here in these pictures on the right hand side. Oops, sorry. Um, obesity is another, another quite early sign. And while patients have normal body weight at birth, 90% of the affected children develop obesity during their first three years of life. In adulthood, obesity is mainly tranquil, while in childhood it is usually described as diffuse. And pathogenesis of obesity is multifactorial, but it, is cert it certainly includes abnormal melanocorticoid receptor and leptin signaling, as um, uh, Elaine will show you later. Most other major organs only emerge later, generally during the two first decades of life. Thus, it is important to mention that the phenotype um, uh, very commonly does not meet um, all the criteria for diagnosis early in life already. Also of note, phenotypic variability in BBS is quite high, even in the same family, and palsy symptomatic forms have been described. Consequentially, average age of diagnosis, according to Phil Beals, is as late as nine years, while in the clinical registry investigation of BBS, the so-called CRIPS initiative, median age was found to, um, a diagnosis was found um, at almost six years. Among the features that develop over time are progressive loss of visual field due to insidious retinopathy, but I will not go into details here since Professor Dolphus will address this topic later. Also about two thirds of patients display developmental delay and about one third presents behavioral abnormalities. Developmental delay is often global, but sometimes specific for some areas like motor and or language. Speech is usually nasal, slow, and with mis misarticulations. The voice is high-pitched in many cases. Behavioral abnormalities observed in, B in the BBS cohort can comprise obsessive, compulsive, and ritualic behavior, anxiety, emotional immaturity, disinhibition, hyperactivity, but also depression. <clears throat> Hypergonadism or genitourinary abnormalities are present in 59% of VBS subjects. In males, manifestations include cryptochism, micropenis, and small volume testes. In females, uterus malformations, vaginal atresia, and polycystic ovaries can be observed. Reproduction, again, is a difficult issue in VBS, but there are quite a few patients who gave birth to children. Most of them um, were uh, individuals, or, mo or most of these individuals were females, but they are rare cases um, originating from males as well. Another secondary feature that is often missed in the clinical routine is a reduced sense of smell. 
with our own working group, we performed a match control systemic olfactory um, evaluation in a total of 75 patients with renal ciliopathies and among them 28 individuals um, with molecularly confirmed BBS. And this study revealed that a reduced sense of smell was observed in all BBS genotypes except for BBS1. And in fact, most of the BBS1 individuals presented a normal or just slightly reduced odor identification. More secondary features are summarized in these pictures, comprising affections of the liver, of the heart, of the gastrointestinal intestinal tract, as well as dental anomalies, hearing loss, and anomalies of the mus uh, musculoskeletal uh, system. Despite a clear definition of clinical criteria, making the diagnosis of BBS often remains quite challenging. This is due to the significant phenotypic overlap, um, uh, uh, phenotypic as well as genetic overlap with other complex syndromes and renal ciliopathies, including Alstom syndrome, Schubert syndrome, Senyalokin syndrome, and even fetal um, uh, and lethal, lethal uh, Meckler-Gruber syndrome. Noteworthy, polyductyly is a clinical feature that is almost exclusive, uh, exclusive to BBS and only shared by Meckler-Gruber syndrome in some single cases. Owing to this clinical uncertainty and at the same time the prognostic consequences of a diagnosis like BBS, a molecular confirmation by modern NGS-based genetic testing is mandatory to confirm the diagnosis. Up to date, pathogenic variants in um, 26 different genes have been identified and associated with the BBS uh, phenotype. Of these, variants in BBS 1 to 18 make up for about 70 to 80 percent of cases. In the Western world, more than 50 percent of the molecular confirmed cases carry variants in one of the following three genes, either BBS 1, 2, or 10. This is an overview and distribution of BBS genotypes from a literature search covering 524 patients published in 20, 2016. This confirms that BBS 1, 2, and 10 to be the most frequent BBS genes affected. However, variants in other BBS genes were found significantly more frequent when compared to, for example, the UK cohort consisting of 350 individuals with 256 genetically confirmed. Here, the predominance of BBS 1, 2, and 10 is a lot more obvious. Those three genes alone account for about 81% of the complete cohort. And also in our German um, Neosys cohort, variants in BBS 1 and 10 make up the vast majority of genetically confirmed patients. However, with the use of modern NGS um, panels and whole exome sequencing, we recently detected more and more variants in other BBS genes as well. Despite the higher amount of genetically confirmed diagnosis, the clinical situation, and particularly personal counseling, has not necessarily become easier in these modern times. In fact, nowadays we often get the result of genetic testing quite early in life, but we still cannot tell for sure what particular disease course to expect in the individual patient. And sometimes it's even hard to decide what syndrome we are talking about, since some of the affected genes are associated to more than one single clinical entity, as shown here in this Venn diagram. Yet what we can tell for sure is that almost all of the affected genes encode proteins that are localized at the so-called primary cilium. Primary cilia are antenna-like cell productions that can be found on almost every human cell type. And the gene products of many hereditary kidney diseases like nephronothysis, polycystic kidney diseases, or Chabert syndrome carry out essential um, roles Sorry. in either the development, structure, or function of primary cilia. This is the reason why these disease entities are also referred to as so-called renal ciliopathies. The primary role of cilia is to transfer different stimuli from the extracellular milieu into the cell and into the nucleus. And by doing this, they have a crucial role in several vital cellular processes, including cell division, cell polarity, and metabolism. Since there's no evidence of protein synthesis within the cilia itself, ciliary proteins need to be transported into and out of the cilium by sophisticated transport mechanisms. And the gene products of BBS genes represent essential players in those um, transport mechanisms. 
And functional studies demonstrated that they form two multimeric complexes, the so-called BB zome and the chaperonin complex. The BB zome is an octomere composed of um, uh, BBS1, 2, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, and BBRP10. It functions as a kind of cargo adapter involved in the intracellular trafficking and it mediates vesicular trafficking of membrane proteins to the primary cilium. The chaperonin complex consisting of BBS6, 10 and 12 mediates the assembly of the BB zone and most other BBS proteins that are neither a part of the BB zone nor the chaperonin complex are also functionally linked to the primary cilium and intracellular trafficking. Several studies have suggested <clears throat> a milder phenotype when BBS1 is involved and uh, more severe than when components of the chaperonin complex are involved. This topic was recently addressed by a meta-analysis published by Niederlover et al, who analyzed the so far largest cohort of BBS patients with a total of 899 individuals by assembling data from 85 articles focusing on genotype-phenotype correlation. The authors used a syndromic score to quantify disease severity. And the first thing they found was that patients with assumed loss of function mutations turned out to have higher syndromic scores than those with missense mutations. Furthermore, the study showed that patients with mutations in BBS3 had a significantly lower syndromic score than patients with mutations in the BB zone or the chaperonin complex. And among patients with mutations in the BB zone components, those with Variants in BBS1 and BBSI showed the lowest mean syndromic score, while patients with mutations BBS2 and BBS7 the highest. But let me get back to clinics. Since BBS is ciliopathy, and as mentioned before, primary cilia can be found on almost all cells and tissues, it's no surprise that ciliopathies can affect more than one single organ. Unfortunately, from my perspective, the kidneys are quite regularly involved in many ciliary linked disease entities, as nicely illustrated here by this cartoon. And thus, again, no surprise, kidney involvement is also um, uh, one of the primary features in BBS, as mentioned before, and can be found in about 50 to 60% of BBS cases. However, it has also been shown that not only disease severity, but also kidney involvement varies significantly between different genotypes. While in this study, less than 20% of BBS uh, patients showed kidney involvement, BBS10 and BBS12 variants were associated with renal phenotype in around about 60%. Moreover, the phenotypic spectrum of kidney disease in Barter Beetle syndrome is highly variable and may comprise anatomical abnormalities like fetal lobulation, unilateral kidney agenesis, horseshoe kidneys, and kidney dysplasia with or without cysts, but also functional disorders like urine concentration deficiency and or progressing renal failure. Here we see an example of a prenatal ultrasound scan showing large hyperechogenic kidneys with cortical and medullary cysts. Postnatally, those cysts might persist, or in some cases, even disappear spontaneously. As mentioned before, persistent fetal lobulation is a benign structural abnormality that is found quite frequently in um, BBS patients, but not only in BBS patients and with no impact on kidney function. Also, more severe structural abnormalities like parenchymal cysts, hydronephrosis, renal genesis, horseshoe kidney, reflux, vaginal um, atresia, and urogenital sinus are part of the phenotypic spectrum of BBS. Urinary tract infections are quite common, while hematuria and proteinuria are absent or uh, generally mild. This is an example of a case report of a BBS patient who experienced neonatal kidney failure caused by severe urogenital malformations in terms of a urogenital sinus coming together with dysplastic kidneys. In some single cases, focal renal scarring detected by DMSA scans has been reported as a manifestation of BBS patients. However, dysplasia and or hyperplasia of the complete kidneys as just recently defined by a very nice ERCNET consensus statement, um, is a lot more frequent. 
and in the UK cohort, in fact, with 50% of the patients displaying a kidney phenotype, um, renal dysplasia with and without the presence of par parenchymal cysts made up for more than 60% of all structural kidney abnormalities. Another characteristic feature of kidney involvement is a reduced urine uh, concentrating capacity clinically presenting as polyuria and polydipsia. In fact, hyperstenuria is the most common, re common renal manifestation, and it is important to mention that hyperstenuria can be observed in all stages of CKD and is independent of the underlying structural abnormalities. Poly and polydip polyuria and polydipsia are well-known features of BBS. However, the underlying mechanisms causing the reduced urine concentrating capacity are still a matter of debate. Some studies suggested aquaporin-2 mistrafficking as a putative mechanism, and others speculated about the role of the thick ascending limb of, limb of Handler, um, since reduced urinary, um, urinary uromodulin excretion was observed in BBS patients. The group of Miriam Zakia has addressed this topic for, topic for many years, and they were able to show that more than half of the BBS patients did not exceed a maximum of urine osmolality to higher than 500 microosmol per kilogram after overnight dehydration. The mean overall maximum uh, urine osmolality was 581 um, milliosmol per kilogram in patients with a normal GVAR. And furthermore, the study revealed that hyperstenuria was aggravated in the setting of truncating mutations when compared to missense variants. And also, the detect detection of hyperstenuria significantly correlated with the renal prognosis, both in terms of baseline GFR and in the annual GFR decline. Noteworthy. The group observed normal to high urine aquaporin levels, contradicting the idea of aquaporin-2 mistrafficking as a cause for the hyperstenuria. And moreover, in the presence of furosemide, they noticed no difference in sodium and chloride absorption, also questioning the suggested role of the thick ascending limb in the pathogenesis of hyperstenuria. Finally, not only were BBS patients unable to concentrate urine adequately during dehydration, but also to dilute urine um, osmolality in a situation of water load. This is displayed here in this graph with the black lines representing the BBS patients and the gray ones, the healthy controls. Structural and functional kidney defects are certainly one thing However, the great fear of the BBS patients and their family is that CKD might progress to end-stage kidney disease. And in fact, although general, generally rare, end-stage kidney disease is the factor that contributes most to mortality in BBS. 72% of patients die because of renal impairment and 25% of them before the age of 44. In contrast, overall survival of all BBS patients is reported as 63 years. The graph on the right shows um, the differences in patients' mortality between individuals with and without kidney failure. Nevertheless, fewer than 10% of uh, children and adults have been noted to, de to develop severe, uh, severely impaired kidney function, while mild stages of CKD are reported in about one-third of children and about 40% of adults. In the British cohort published by Elizabeth Forces, there were 49 cases of, uh, with chronic kidney disease in childhood, and most of them were CKD stages two or three. However, noteworthy, six out of eight cases with end-stage kidney disease occurred in the first year of life. Overall kidney survival in the study was um, 94%, as shown here in this couple and mile survival curve. And furthermore, the authors noted a significant difference between genotypes again. BBS 10 patients here in the red bars were, um, uh, uh, were more frequently affected by a severe kidney phenotype when compared to individuals carrying BBS 1 variants and gray bars. And another study affirmed these findings 
here the authors identified an increased prevalence of severe kidney disease in individuals with BBS2, BBS10 or BBS12 compared to individuals with BBS1. And at the same time, homozygous or compound heterozygous individuals with truncating variants were more likely to be associated with a severe disease phenotype than those with two missense variants. In a French adult cohort, um, BBS6, BBS10 and BBS12 were associated with a more severe CKD. These three genes comprise the chaperonin complex that has also been associated with a more severe BBS disease course um, overall in various other studies. And last year's study was published that made use of the data from the CRIPS registry. CRIPS, as I mentioned, is a global self-reporting database comprising more than, yeah, at the time, 600, um, today actually more than 700 BBS patients, and by thus, uh, by thus representing the largest cohort worldwide. And of those, at the time, 364 individuals were genetically characterized and 7.2% developed end-stage kidney disease. Median age at end-stage kidney disease was 12.5 years, and almost 90% of cases developed end-stage kidney disease before the age of 30. And in this study, female sex, truncating variants, and surprisingly BBS genes that were neither associated with the BBSOME nor the chaperonin complex were identified as risk factors. Also noteworthy, neither the presence of uropathies nor the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus did have a significant impact on the occurrence of end-stage kidney disease in this study. This figure shows that the presence of two truncating variants was significantly overrepresented in individuals with kidney failure when compared to the overall cohort. The authors concluded that two truncating variants, irrespective of the effect of gene, are an independent risk factor for the development of kidney failure. And they also observed that in the setting of two truncating variants, onset of end-stage kidney disease was significantly, significantly earlier when compared to other individuals developing end-stage kidney disease. Quite unexpectedly, this study revealed that variants in BBS genes neither belonging to BBSOME nor the chaperonin complex were associated with worse kidney survival. By age 20, almost 60% of individuals with those variants and other BBS genes um, showed or developed kidney failure as compared to 5% in the BBSOME genes and 8% in the chaperonin complex. However, this observation has to be questioned when taking into account that five out of the corresponding nine patients carried variants in BBS16 that is also known as NPHP10 or Senyaloken syndrome um, um, 7. Um, so all five developed kidney failure before the age of 13 years and thus maybe rather presented a nephronothysis-like phenotype than a BBS-specific one, especially considering that none of these five patients had polyductyly. Taken together, the exact pathogenesis of progressing CKD and BBS is not completely clear yet. Besides hypertension, obesity, and diabetes as known risk factors for the progression of CKD, renal hypersthenuria seems to be negatively associated. Furthermore, recent in vitro data suggests the impact of metabolic aberrations in the pathogenesis of BBS-related kidney disease. However, the precise mechanisms still need to be unraveled. Finally, a quick word about kidney transplantation in the setting of BBS. Studies addressing these issues um, are quite scarce. However, kidney transplantation is an option for BBS patients and should be considered. And in fact, it has been shown that the outcomes are comparable to those in the general population. However, massive obesity has to be considered as a limit, especially when considering that in many case reports, a dis uh, disproportionate increase of the post-transport BMI has been observed. I hope that I was able to stress the point that the management of Barter Beetle syndrome is a multidisciplinary challenge and it um, takes many hands to master all the patient's requirements. And with this, I would like uh, to hand over to Hélène and summarize um, what I have learned and we have learned in the, in the past 20 to 30 minutes with the following eight lines. When children drink lots and often eat plenty, when their fingers and toes add up to higher than 20, when speech is delayed and the penis is buried, when parents and doctors are equally worried, when night vision is blurred or even a mess, then go for genetics. It might be BBS.
Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. This was really wonderful. And uh, yeah, it's such a uh, difficult disease with a lot of features, and you explained it really in a very, very good, comprehensive way in uh, such a short time period. So congratulations. Thank you very much. We can relax now, and uh, we will move to Elaine. Um, uh, let me introduce her. So Professor Elaine Dolfus uh, has two medical specialists. So she is a, a specialist in ophthalmology and also in medical genetics. She's a professor of medical genetics at the University of Strasbourg and consultant at the Strasbourg University Hospital, where she is the head of the medical genetics department and the coordinator of several networks, such as uh, the rare uh, center of the rare eye diseases, the fringe network of sensorial diseases, and the European reference network for rare eye diseases. So this is really quite a job, Elaine, that you are doing. So Elaine is also the director of the Mixed Insurm University of Strasbourg Research Laboratory, where she supervises the research group Phenogene, and uh, she is also the lead of the Alsatian Institute of Medical Genetics and the recipient of many, many prizes. And she is really an expert in the um, I uh, phenotype um, of Bardal Beetle syndrome. So, Elaine, we are really welcome to, to this webinar, uh, to this joint webinar, and uh, we are going to learn a lot of you. And uh, please ask questions uh, in the uh, question box on your tool. And uh, please go ahead, Elaine. Thank you again for joining us. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we yeah, can okay, hear fine. you. Okay, you, fine. Uh, so thank you, Elena, very much for this very kind introduction and congratulations to Jens for a fantastic overview of Bardet Beetle syndrome. So I will try maybe to add uh, a little bit of our expertise uh, in, on the eye field, uh, especially as here I represent uh, ERNI. So just let me know if the slide, oops, uh, if the slide is moving. I'm not sure you, um, uh, I think I have a small technical problem. So we can see your slide actually. So. You, you can see the slide? Yeah, yeah. now it's okay, okay. I have a strange, uh, aspect on my on my screen so this is fine yeah so my disclosure so uh so as uh, jans uh, just uh, uh, explained the uh, bardet beetle is a part of a big group of uh, rare disorders that are the ciliopathies ciliopathies that are due to dysfunction of the primary cilia and we know that there are many different syndromes uh, that are defined by the different uh, organs that are affected due to mutations in specific uh, ciliary genes. So there are target organs like the CNS, the eye, the kidney, as we just saw, and adding up the different uh, uh, manifestations, we, we get uh, into a sort of old age classification with uh, uh, very uh, um, um, personalized the names of syndromes like bardet beetle syndrome, Alström syndrome, Juber syndrome. But at the time being, finally, probably the ciliopathies, if we look at them overall, is probably a spectrum of disease. However, um, some groups are very well defined, like the bardet beetle uh, syndrome, with uh, the signs that Jens uh, just uh, described. So just to, to emphasize maybe a few, uh, a few uh, clinical hints, indeed, polydactyly is a very good... Uh, a very good sign to um, to think about this this condition, especially when there are kidney problems or eye problems in a young child. And you can see on the on the slide the the the, the frequency of the different malformations or developmental abnormalities that can be observed with at first hand and feet, and then the kidney developmental abnormalities. Um, also, the neurodevelopmental features are very, can be important, but are not automatic. And uh, please, as uh, Jens just uh, uh, um, um, detailed, anosmia is a very good uh, clinical sign for Bardet Beetle. Um, 
kidney disease you ju we've just been through, and as you understood, it is not obligatory, um, only uh, a, 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 percent, a limited percentage of the patients, as we've just seen, will go to end-stage kidney uh, failure. So I think somewhere um, the parents have to be reassured on this. Of course, uh, um, we have to follow up the children or, and, and the young and the adults on the kidneys, but um, um, it, not all the patients will develop end-stage uh, uh, kidney failure. And this is uh, somewhere in some uh, books, it's, uh, it's um, addressed as quite common. So I think uh, like other symptoms, we have to be really prudent in how we, we present uh, the syndromes and the variability in each uh, patient. So hypogonadism, also this has been uh, this has been described uh, just uh, by Jens. And uh, on the endocrine side, obesity is uh, very, uh, very common with uh, a very um, important sign that is hyperphagia that we will uh, speak about at the end of, of, of the talk. Uh, patients also develop type 2 diabetes and also metabolic disorders. And all this occurring uh, uh, in a higher percentage than it would occur in the standard uh, uh, obese uh, population. Another point uh, is that is also important is the sleeping disorder that is not uh, specific, but that occurs uh, quite uh, often in these patients. And uh, this has to be uh, explored with uh, uh, sleeping apnea. So just um, as Jens uh, specified, uh, concerning the obesity, it's important to note that the, the children's weight at birth is, is normal, but the weight can gain quite rapidly uh, during uh, childhood. And uh, for us uh, in a rare eye, uh, eye disease uh, clinic, when you see a child uh, with obesity and uh, visual problems, we really very quickly think about uh, Bardebido. So concerning the genetics, Jens has already said a lot. It's uh, uh, considered as an autosomal recessive condition. There has been a lot of discussion around oligogenism and um, triallelism, uh, and this has been a matter of discussion. Uh, of course, there are very uh, probably gene modifiers, but for genetic counseling, we have to consider this uh, condition at the time being as a classical autosomal uh, recessive uh, condition. And this is important for uh, prenatal diagnosis and genetic counseling overall. Um, as you understood, there is a high level of genetic heterogeneity, of uh, um, more than 25 uh, BBS genes, and it's a lot of uh, exons uh, to cover uh, for uh, diagnosis. And of course, the techniques for diagnosis has evolved, and depending on where uh, and in which country or even in which region, in some countries, uh, the test is performed. Uh, usually today it's either panels or exomes or even whole genomes, uh, for instance, in, in France at the time being, uh, for inherited retinal dystrophies, we have a, a genome-first approach in the, in the um, in the context of the national uh, genomic uh, uh, French uh, plan. Uh, we can speak about this in the, in the discussion later on. So as Jens just said, there are the two most frequent genes is really BBS1 and BBS10. These are really the most uh, common. They account at least for 40%. And then we have all the others, uh, BBS2, which is also quite common, and then all the others. Today, how many genes exactly? It's Difficult to say because probably more than 25, the last genes that have been described, um, sometimes it's just one family or uh, there is a, a not as much evidence as for, for the other genes. Anyway, I mean, uh, we can consider that there are more than 25 genes that are, uh, that are involved. Um, and um, of course, uh, to, to be able to certify the diagnosis, as I said, is we have to consider autosomal recessive, uh, uh, the condition is autosomal recessive with biallelic pathogenic variants, uh, meaning this class four or five uh, genetic variants for a positive uh, molecular diagnosis. 
And when it's class three variants, um, uh, it's, uh, we have to have uh, uh, some functional assays or some uh, real evidence uh, to consider them as uh, diagnostics. At the time being, we have around 10% of the patients anyway in the French court where we that patients that have evident uh, clinical diagnosis of Bardet-Biedl but that are uh, still unsolved and for which we have no genetic diagnosis and we are still working on identifying new uh, BBS genes. And of course with the advent of uh, next generation uh, sequencing exome sequencing and the whole genome sequencing, we have been able to perform uh, uh, some uh, some uh, resolving of uh, unsolved patients, uh, like uh, uh, for uh, 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 retrotransposon insertion in the BBS1 gene that was found uh, in heter unsolved heterozygote uh, BBS1 patients. Just this is just an example where, in improving the genetic tool, we managed to uh, solve more patients. Uh, we also, in our group, we have been able to, to identify uh, a founder variant in uh, La Réunion Island with, on the BBS3 uh, gene. And uh, just to complete what I said before about the oligogenic inheritance, uh, it's more than certain that second site modifiers are influencing uh, the phenotype. Uh, but uh, these uh, modifiers, they have been studied and uh, there, there is some evidence for this. Ideally, we should have uh, very large studies uh, to really uh, be able to use these uh, information for genetic, pro uh, for clinical prognosis, uh, which at the time is still prudent. Um, so this I was just uh, telling you about the, the founder effect and the mechanism, the new mechanism we can uh, we can identify. And also in Strasbourg, we have been working on a national court of uh, antenatal uh, presentation of uh, fetuses with uh, which presented a, a biallelic pathogenic uh, variant in the bar beetle genes. And uh, we found that many of these like um, fetuses with, for instance, hydrometrocolpos, which can be uh, um, ultrasound uh, hint for bar beetle, which is a, which can be found as a tumor in the in the fetus um, um, was supposed to be only due to one or two BBS genes, but we showed that the presentation with hydrometrocolpos uh, can occur in uh, uh, different BBS genes. It's not only one BBS gene. So now I will focus more on um, uh, the way where we see patients in, in my center here, it's uh, around the, the retinal uh, dystrophy uh, because uh, retinal uh, degeneration is really uh, a very penetrant uh, treat in uh, bar de beetle. And just to remind you, uh, the retina is 10 uh, layers of cells and the more external uh, layer is uh, the photoreceptor cells, the cone, the cones and the rods. And it's the place where uh, the, the, the light uh, is going to be processed to become um, an electro, uh, an electric uh, stimulus to the other cells, and then to go to the brain to be analyzed as an image. So, the photoreceptor cells, they are very important for vision, and um, uh, they have in fact a modified cilia structure. As uh, you can see on the right side of the slide, um, in fact there are two compartments uh, uh, in the photoreceptors that are separated by what we call the connecting cilium. And the proteins of the photoreceptors, they are synthesized in the external part, and then they, they go to the internal part where there is a rhodopsin and the uh, stacks and where uh, the photorecept the phototransduction uh, takes place. So if the traffic is uh, not going well at, at this level, there are many ways where the cell will not cope with this and then progressively degenerate. So the rods and the cones can be affected in Bardevidal, uh, inducing uh, what we call 
commonly retinitis pigmentosa, but as we will see, there are different forms. In the classical form, uh, there are difficulties in the night vision, nyctalopia. It's patients who are very, who have difficulties when uh, the light is dim. And um, this you can observe in children. Uh, they can have, a, they can be extremely anxious in more than a usual child in dim light. And then the other sign is a progressive constriction of the visual field. Um, at the end, it's like if you look uh, through a, a, a hole of a, in a, of a, um, in a, in a door. So it's, uh, it's, it's, this is a great uh, source of handicap, especially for children uh, to recognize people, to, to play ball games, uh, etc. And at the end, unfortunately, in the classical evolution of retinitis pigmentosa, the central vision is affected, all this leading to visual impairment and visual handicap. So we have a number of different uh, uh, tests we've performed to, 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 for this diagnosis. Uh, a lot of these tests are not accessible for very small children. So uh, we adapt the tests as also for uh, for uh, visual for measuring the visual acuity, the visual fields, and there are a lot of techniques of um, of um, of imaging that permits uh, to um, to to give the, the the diagnosis of retinal uh, degeneration. Um, and also one major uh, test is electroretinograms, and I'll get back to this in a minute. Uh, usually the children, they develop a visual impairment uh, around the age of five. We can see that they, it's not, and there is a lot of variability. And then uh, the visual impairment develops during adolescence, and uh, usually the patients are registered as legally blind uh, at the early adulthood. So you have here the classification of visual impairments. This is um, maybe not very interesting for you, but for the patients it's very important uh, because they have to have the legal recognition uh, and, and it's different in different countries, but it's very important to to be uh, legally recognized uh, as having a visual impairment or legal blindness for the patients. So. Again, retinal dystrophy is nearly, I would say, 100% penetrant in Bardet-Biddle. If you know about a patient with no retinal dystrophy, please tell me. I would be extremely interested. Uh, but there is a lot of variability, and sometimes the, the diagnosis can be quite uh, late. So it's the most common uh, form of uh, uh, syndromic retinitis pigmentosa, and uh, uh, at the same level is Usher syndrome, which is another syndromic retinitis pigmentosa with deafness and retin retinal degeneration. Um, so I've already been uh, telling you about the, 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 the ages where this, this occurs and how you can suspect that the child has a retinal uh, dystrophy. And the, Diagnosis really relies on the retinal imaging and the electroretinogram. And of course, if you have a, a molecular diagnosis in addition, uh, you can suspect very much that there is a retinal dystrophy. Um, as opposed to Alstrom syndrome, who is very close to Bardet-Biddle syndrome, I will not detail this, but Alstrom syndrome, the patients, they have a lot of photophobia. They are intolerant to light. In Bardet-Biddle, it's more the dim light that is a problem at the beginning of the disease. And uh, you can see here uh, how, wh how uh, 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 peripheral visual field can hamper uh, the daily life uh, uh, of children. Uh, one uh, very important diagnostic tool is the electroretinogram. This is an easy test to perform where we monitor, in fact, the, the, the electric uh, uh, response of the retina. And we test by, with this test uh, cones and rods. And this is a quite easy um, uh, um, test. It has a very bad reputation. I know <laughs> the nephrologist uh, uh, with whom I have been speaking about this uh, quite recently, um, they uh, have a very bad feeling about this exam, but 
there are techniques now where you do not put uh, um, uh, directly a lens on the eye, but you put just a very small electrode and you see this child is, is doing this uh, very, very easily. So, uh, so electroretinogram is very important as well as imaging and you can see various si signs as long as the child can be, uh, can be still on, on, um, on the apparatus. So how do the, the retinal dystrophy occur in uh, ciliopathies? Uh, what we think is that there is accumulation uh, between the two segments of the photoreceptor cell of proteins who do not manage to get in the outer segment of the of the photoreceptor so this is one thing and that on the other side more recently it has been shown that probably proteins that have to go back to the inner segment are also uh, um, cannot go back correctly and this also leads to uh, retinal uh, degeneration there are many animal models uh, um, for for this and uh, one uh, one um, pathogenesis uh, feature is probably the protein overload, as I just said, that induces uh, ER stress and, un and an unfolded protein response at the level of the photoreceptors. There are probably other, um, I, I will not get too much into the details here, but there are probably other triggers to go to the apoptosis of the photoreceptors, but this is really a, a long chronic process, but that leads really to the death of these cells. Um, uh, there is a lot of clinical variability in bound beetle syndrome. And uh, for instance, for intellectual impairment, this is very much the case, but also very much for retinal dystrophy. And um, we have seen uh, patients who have developed a central uh, dystrophy, and this is usually not the case, and, uh, uh, but this exists, and so they start with the central alteration of the vision compared to other patients who have the peripheral visual at first. Also on the other side, we have seen patients who had a normal electroretinogram until the age of 15, which is very unusual in this, in this, in this condition, but this exists. So this um, we have, if you have a doubt, please go on in following up the patients with the, the retinal dystrophy. I see the time is going very quickly. So just also to tell you, there can be isolated retinitis pigmentosa, which are not syndromic with mutations in BBS genes. So the overall care of the patient is uh, really multidisciplinary, as Jens uh, uh, said, and al also at the level of the, um, of the eye, because there is a lot of uh, low vision aids that can be, uh, that can be provided, uh, su uh, psychological support. And at the time being, there is no specific treatment for the retina, but there is a lot of research like uh, gene uh, therapy and a lot of professionals who are involved uh, for uh, the care of the patients. So the last part of the talk is about uh, a, a treatment that is now accessible. And I thank uh, uh, the Rhythm Pharmaceuticals who provided me with uh, these uh, slides, which are very, uh, very um, uh, pedagogic. Um, so the set, set melanotide is a, a, a molecule um, that is an agonist of MC4R uh, receptors at the level of the uh, uh, hypothalamus. And um, it uh, uh, restores a signal that is impaired uh, in Bardebidol, but also in other uh, genetic obesities, as you know, the POMC uh, obesities that are very usually very severe. And um, the paths, the physiopathological paths of uh, this type of obesity, they, um, they are uh, common at the level of the hypothalamus. So um, set, um, um, what I told you also uh, importantly at the beginning is about the hyperphagia of the patients. And probably the obesity in band de beetle is has different, uh, uh, different causes probably a peripheral cause uh, at the level of the adipose tissue, but also a central cause at the level of the hypothalamus. 
So um, one of the targets uh, that can be uh, um, uh, that that can be used uh, to uh, fight against the obesity in Bar de Bidol, in addition to uh, the usual uh, diet and um, the usual uh, care for obesity, is to target the MC uh, for our uh, neurons to address uh, uh, the satiety uh, signal and to reduce hyperphagia. Uh, and uh, this uh, is a molecule um, that has been uh, studied again for uh, classical hypothalamic uh, genetic uh, uh, obesities, but also for Bardet-Biedel uh, syndrome. Um, I see there is not a lot of time left, but there have been, of course, clinical studies that have showed that this uh, uh, this treatment uh, um, is um, can lead to an improvement in uh, the hunger scores, an improvement with the weight loss, a significant weight loss after one year, and uh, uh, also an improvement in the BMI Z score of uh, uh, these uh, these patients. So the name of the molecule is Imsivre. Um, I don't know if I pronounce it right, but anyway, uh, there has been uh, um, uh, a lot of um, of uh, uh, regulatory uh, successes for this uh, uh, molecule, and uh, um, it's only uh, it was initially uh, dedicated to biallelic uh, pro opio melanocortin uh, uh, obesity genetic uh, obesities um, with the different genes uh, concerned, and there was an approval at the FDA and at the AMA respectively in 2020 and 2021. And in France, there was an early access approval in January 2022. So this is very recent. And there has been an extension of the indication uh, uh, for a BBS with an approval uh, in 2022 uh, in, for the FDA and EMA. And uh, an approval also for the indication of BBS as an early access since um, uh, July 2022 in France. So these are this is a slide on on the clinical development uh, on the different uh, obesities uh, genetic obesities but also on Bardet Biedel uh, syndrome so I will go through and here I think this is important as I know there are a lot of countries uh, connected this is how uh, uh, Imsivre is accessible uh, in the different uh, European uh, uh, countries and uh, for uh, BBS in Germany, for instance, it's approved for monogenic obesity and Bardet Biedel since April 2023. And for instance, in France, um, it has approved also for monogenic obesity and Bardet Biedel since uh, last uh, summer. And you can see here uh, the monogenic obesity approvals, but not for BBS in the, um, uh, in the, in the countries that are just uh, under. So um, I will just take the example in France. The prescription is a, a hospital prescription. It's for children above the age uh, and adults. Uh, so it, the age limit is six years old. Um, the non eligibility criteria is hepatic impairment and stage renal disease and uh, um, significant hyper study, uh, hypersensitivity to the studied drug and suicidal ideation. The eligibility criteria is obesity and hyperphagia. And um, uh, what we, what is actually um, the way how we prescribe this is with a multidisciplinary team. And this is, I think, my last slide. So uh, we have a multidisciplinary uh, um, conference uh, every month or every two months where we discuss uh, the each, uh, each case with a specialist endocrine, pediatric endocrine specialist uh, and other BBS uh, specialists. And then uh, the prescription is decided on. And uh, then, uh, of course, there is uh, actually at the time being a data collection uh, that is uh, actually done on uh, uh, the patient who are uh, treated uh, in in France. So um, I'm I've just finished in time, I think. 
Um, so I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I hope there are still there is still time for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. It was really wonderful, and really your two talks complemented each other very well. Um, yeah, and uh, I think you covered really the topic um, in a beautiful, beautiful way. So there are questions coming. I will just read them for you, and you can decide among you who is uh, who is going to answer. Uh, so the quest, uh, first question is uh, from Marion Vallet. And the question is, uh, the origin of um, hypostenuria is unknown, but um, um, so what do the water restriction tests show? Are the water restriction tests done? And is it a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? And uh, whether there is a link to uh, hypothalamic anomalies? So it's a, it's a long question with several questions there in it. Sir. Could you follow, Jens? Yes? Yeah, okay. I could I could follow. Um, I cannot completely answer this question. Well, um, water deprivation has tests have been done, and osmolality, as I have shown actually pretty quickly, um, did um, not increase um, in at least half of the patients to further than 500 milliosmol. So there there is um, a deficiency, but whether there is a link to the hypothalamic um, uh, level. Um, if there is, I, I don't know about this link. Okay, thank you. I was actually wondering whether this uh, concentration, urine concentration defect is progressive. Do you know whether it's, uh, it's getting worse over time? In my experience, I don't know that from the literature, but from the patients I'm following, um, I would say yes. Um, uh, there are a lot of patients who, when they um, uh, progress with CKD, um, report that um, the polyuria, uh, polyuria gets worse. Mm -hmm. So yes, okay. I would guess so, yes. Okay, thank you. So I think the question to both of you, uh, what are recommend the recommendations for the follow-up of those patients, sir? Uh, who should follow them, with uh, uh, which frequency, um, what do you think? Might be written in the guideline, but the guideline <laughs> is not yet there, so... <laughs> the guideline is in preparation and it's a work that is being done with, uh, with uh, all the ERNs, so it's, uh, it's in process and uh, hopefully by the end of the year the guidelines will be available, but I think the follow-up of these children and these adults is is quite uh, uh, quite important uh, uh, at the level of the of course of the kidneys and I will let Jens uh, um, uh, speak about this. Uh, but also um, on the metabolic point of view again, but also on the ophthalmic uh, point of view because uh, they may have uh, uh, complications like cataracts, for instance, uh, that would need that can improve a little bit the vision. Um, and uh, also, um, yeah, we, we, we advocate usually for a yearly follow-up uh, with a list of uh, items uh, to, to do. I don't know what you think, Jens? Well, uh, that's a hard, a, a really tough question to answer, because yes. um, <laughs> in a perfect <laughs> world, um, we would all wish for a multidisciplinary panel who is uh, who are seeing um, uh, where several specialists are seeing the patients at the same time, um, and then probably once a year um, makes sense. And from the from the nephrologist um, perspective, I'd say as long as um, it is just about um, uh, urine concentrating capacity that is reduced, and uh, we're talking about normal kidney function once a year is absolutely fine. As soon as there are problems in terms of progressing CKD um, or um, recurrent urinary tract infections, um, patients should present um, uh, more frequently. Thank you very much. Another difficult question is about their, uh, their, their genetic counseling of the families. So what, uh, how do you counsel those people? Or, um, I think it's uh, difficult because you have different prognostic uh, factors. There is really no clear genotype-phenotype correlation. So do you have some suggestions for that? Do you recommend to test uh, the siblings, uh, other family members? So can you comment on that? Um, 
Yeah, maybe. Um, so I think the genetic counseling, as I said, is autosomal recessive and we forget about the oligogenism. This is the first point. The second point is, uh, for instance, uh, for a couple who has already had a child with Bardet-Biddle and who asks for, for instance, for prenatal diagnosis or preimplantary diagnosis, and you know about uh, the, the, the variants, the pathogenic variants, 100% sure, and if they ask for prenatal diagnosis or preimplantary diagnosis, usually this is uh, accepted uh, anyway in my in my in my country. Um, and uh, because usually, I mean, it's a multi-handicapped, highly disabling uh, condition, and uh, some some children are very uh, very affected. And uh, when a, a pa parents have Child, a child like that, of course, we can we can understand this. Now, on the other point, I would say for patients who are um, mutated in BBS1 and BBS10, it is worthwhile, and especially for BBS1, to test the siblings because it can occur that in the general uh, population, their future spouse is also heterozygous, uh, and they may be also heterozygous. So, for the common genes. We are very prudent too, because we have seen uh, already what we call pseudo-dominance, meaning uh, Bardet-Biddle syndrome occurring uh, in um, recurrent generations in the same family. So by chance, uh, another person in the general population may be heterozygote. I don't know if that was the question. Um, yeah, 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 I think so, yeah. Uh, yes, do you have comments on that? No? Okay, then I have... Uh, Okay, then I have a comment from Miriam Zakia. Um, she writes that um, they, um, they had the urine concentration tests like with DDRVP and there was a, a, a resistance to DDRVP uh, similar to nephrogenic um, and the ISO. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's what you also told her, uh, but uh, there was no real difference in aquaporin expression. So it was a little bit contradictory. Thanks very much, Miriam. <laughs> Happy that you contributed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there is another question also from Miriam. So she says, uh, can you comment on the possibility that the uh, set melanto not died, huh? it's a difficult name of the drug, mm -hmm. um, could protect also from uh, CKD progression by targeting leptin signaling? and controlling obesity. Do you think it will help? Uh, the well, uh, directly, I don't know, of course. Uh, and the biology uh, is, as you know, very, very complex, but indirectly, of course, if you lose, this is a uh, quite common sense, if you lose weight and uh, you know also as a nephrologist, uh, consequences of obesity on uh, kidney function. So, so um, and indirectly, uh, I suppose, yes, maybe Jens has a, uh, has um, uh, uh, um, a comment on this, but anyway, I, and I don't think there is enough follow-up for uh, long enough on all these courts of patients to know. But uh, logically, well, one would think that it's uh, better to lose weight and they lose uh, uh, around 15% of their weight uh, in average uh, for some patients more, and this can be, of course, uh, helpful. But Jens, maybe the nephrologist view on this. The nephrologist view on this is exactly the same as you said. Well, the data we have from the um, set um uh, studies are just 12 months follow up. So we can't really answer this question yet. And all I can add is that it will be of very high importance what Ellen um, uh, showed on her um, on her slides that is important to follow these patients who um, are treated um, in uh, in a very detailed way to answer to be able to answer these questions in a few years time yes okay thank you very much and so can you share your experience how fast is the effect on their weight sir, by this drug uh, I'm not sure how fast is so the... How fast uh, do you see the effects of cetmelanotid uh, in there on the weight loss? So uh, it's not a, a dramatic rapid uh, effect, it is progressive. Uh, uh, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not um, in two months, uh, it needs a few, uh, a few, and there is um, 
a curve uh, on this. I'm I'm not a pediatric endocrinologist, but on my on my uh, small experience, I, I have seen in a, for instance in the body a bodybuilder patient uh, who was so obese that he could not uh, get out of a wheelchair. Uh, uh, he lost uh, 30 kilos in uh, around uh, six months, which was quite impressive, a uh, little more than six months, but it was very impressive. And he could walk after that. So this is a sort of miracle. Um, uh, but uh, for other patients, it doesn't work as, as, as well. So it's, there is also a heterogeneity in the response of the, to the treatment. Um, hmm. Yeah, so it's variable. Okay. And probably yeah. some lose uh, less, less uh, rapidly and less weight. Mm -hmm. I think it's very good to hear for many people and that uh, this drug is already available in several countries for genetic obesity. And I suppose as a company, uh, tries to get it registered or uh, reimbursed for Bartle Beetle also. So I, I, I was surprised to see the Netherlands, for example, on this list. Probably my colleagues specialized in Bartle Beetle are aware of that, but we can we can mm -hmm. check it on, uh, on our side. So I'm just checking uh, my question list. A lot of people congratulate you with a wonderful webinar. So it just, uh, uh, yeah, I don't see other questions except thank you and congratulations. So. I think we can end here by thanking both of you for the wonderful webinar. I will give a word to, to Stephanie to make some announcements. And thank you very much indeed. The webinar will be published on the website of our ERN so people still can watch it and, uh, and enjoy this, uh, your wonderful talks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you also from my side. And I just wanted to a little promote our um, ERCnet patient disease brochures, which we are currently producing. And Bartle Beetle was the first finalized one. And we have it actually here also in printout and on our website in eight different languages. So if you are interested in a topic, I would recommend you to just have a look and to see um, uh, maybe also to refer this to your patients um, who you are in charge of. Yes, this was from my side and thank you again for uh, the speakers for this great webinar and I wish you all a nice afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye everybody, we can close and we can close in time. I have two speakers and still in time. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.